Welcome back. Today we will be talking about how to use what we have learned so far to solve any equations that involving exponentials and logarithmic. Before we go ahead and do all the examples, we want to review a little bit about the tools we have. We basically have two big chunk of toolbox. The first one, we know the property of log. It change multiplication to be addition, quotient to be subtraction, and finally power. To be multiplication. With this, we can expand or combine multiple logs, <laughs> one complex one complex log into multiple logs, which we call expanding. And then we can combine multiple simple logs into one big log, which we call combining. The second part are some simple facts. Using the property of inverse function, we know if you do exponential and then you do the log, they cancel out. And if you do the log and then exponential, they also cancel out. Now with these two big set of toolbox, now we will run a lot of examples to let you see how to handle this in real life. Okay? So everything is solved for x because we have an equation. Later we will show how to use this in real life by showing you some applications. But for now, let's try them. The first one. Okay? Our trouble is we have exponential here. I really wish this 3 is not there. Now it's time for us to use the property. If you want to get rid of the 3, you just apply the log base 3 on both sides. Then these two cancel, you have this. The one term on the right looks fancy, but remember, this is nothing but just a number. It's not an easy number which we can figure out. If it's a 9 here, we know it's 2. If it's 7, it's going to be something with a decimal. We don't know, but let's just keep it there. Then the answer is going to be, without the calculator, this is the best you can do. With the calculator, you can go ahead and finish. Okay, So this is pretty nice. Using a log, you can get rid of the exponentials. That's nice. Now let's try something even more fancier. Okay. Now you want to take the log. You want to ask yourself, which log do you want to take? If you take a 2, it will cancel this. But if you do this on the left, you need to do the same thing on the right. This will not cancel the 3. Okay. If you do a 3 here, which will cancel this, but then this 2 will be a leftover. Either way, you have one leftovers, and it really doesn't matter which one you do. So for me, I can take log base 2, log base 3, or I can pick ln, simply because it's easier to write down. Now you can see, even though they don't cancel out cleanly, what you have is the property of log. You can take the power down. Remember to, remember to put a parenthesis because 2x minus 1 are together. Now what's your job? Your job is to try to solve for x. How do you solve for x? Well, these two things look fancy, but they're nothing but just numbers. You can pretend they're 4 and 5. So how do you solve something that looks like this? You simply just factor everything out, move all the x on the one side, everything else on the other side, and solve. Now you just have some number, which looks weird, but again, it's just numbers. So let's FOIL everything out. Who has x? This term and this term. Then move them together. And why do you want to move them together? Because then you can factor out this x.
and then you just divide whatever number you have there. Remember, it looks weird, but after all, it's just a number. All right, that's how we are going to solve exponential functions. From here, you can see you simply just apply a log, and then the exponential will not be there. Even sometimes you have two different bases, like a two and three, you can apply any log with a base two or base three. It's just, it's not going to be clean. But again, by the power law of logarithmics, you can always take the power down. So after that, you have a number times whatever here. If it's a nice number, so be it. If it's not a nice number, it's not too complicated either. Okay, so that's how we handle exponentials. Now let's see how we handle log. First example, very easy to understand. You have a log and you don't like the log. Can you get rid of the log? Of course, just do exponential. You do it on one side, you do it on the other side. After that, they cancel, you have this. Now, no log. That's great. Okay, so here's the first principle. If you see a log and you don't like the log, you just apply exponential to cancel it. Just as when you see exponential, you apply a log to cancel it. After that, the log is gone. You have something where you are very familiar with. That's nice. Okay. Now let's try to make things a little bit harder. What we have this time is second, not this one. Now, what do you have? You have log base 10, by the way, if we don't write anything, it's base 10. And what you want is you want to get rid of the log. Oh, let's do base 2. This one is base 2. Okay. What you want to do is you want to get rid of the two logs. So what you can do is you can take 2 to the log. But then you have a problem. Can you distribute 2 to both of them? So eventually you get this one. As far as I know, we don't know any law which looks like this. Right? We can only handle something like this. We know that if there's one log, one, two, you got an x. But if there are two logs summed together, I'm not sure. Okay, so at least we cannot do it directly. Now, a second thought, this is where the combining makes sense because you have two logs and you desperately want only one log. You wish it's only one log, right? But do you have a way to combine multiple logs into one log? Yes, expanding. And when you see a summation, you change it to be multiplication. So that's the key. When you have multiple logs, try to combine them into one log. After that, feel free to use the exponential to cancel it. What you have is x squared plus 2x equals 2 to the cube, because we need to do the same thing on the right, which is 8. After that, it's a standard quadratic. That's pretty nice, and that's step one. Now, what you have is the solution to the quadratic. But where did you get the quadratic? You get the quadratic from the log. Then you need to maybe check these two numbers and try to see if it's legit. I know it's legit for the quadratic, but if it's legit for the log, why? Because log does have some restrictions. That is, the domain has to be positive. Okay, 
if you try to recall the graph, log is not defined for any x less than 0. So this is the domain. Then, clearly, if you plug in 2 back, okay, x plus 2, and this one is 1 plus 2, which is 3. So that one works. This one is qualified. But now if you check and you plug in negative 4, automatically starting from here, you say this is not possible because, because it's not in the domain. So even though we have two things working for the quadratic, but when you get the quadratic, you kind of forget what's going on with the log. So when you finish, you have to plug everything you get from the quadratic back to the log and to try to see if it's illegal or not for this restriction. So final answer, x equals to 2 x equals negative 4 is not in the domain. Okay, so two takeaways. Number one, if you have multiple log, combine them into one, then you do the exponential. Number two, once you get rid of the log, you get rid of this restriction, right? But this restriction was originally here, so when you finish, you have to plug everything back to make sure that it's legal for you to get rid of the log. It looks a little bit uh, complicated, so let's try another one. This time, quickly. Step one, I would move every log together. And then I can combine them. For this case, it's a minus, so it's dividing. Without saying anything, if a log here indicates it's log base 10. Okay, now let's apply 10 to the power on both sides. And we have 2x plus 3 equals 10x, which gives us 8x equals 3, x equals 3 half. That's 3 eighths. So far, so good. Now one more thing to check. Plug this one back into the log, because starting from here, you remove the log. Okay. And try to see, do you have anything negative inside the log? Positive for sure, positive for sure, so everything is legal. Therefore, this is the solution. If you check it and it didn't work, then your answer should be no solution for this case because you only have one choice and that choice is not working. Okay. All right. That's all the basics of how to solve exponential and the logs. There is only one principle. That is, when you say exponential, you get rid of the exponential by applying a log by yourself. When you see a log, you apply exponential to get rid of the log and then continue. If you have multiple logs, combine them first into one single log, which you know how to do from the previous section called combining, and then apply the log. That will be all the standard procedure we need to solve exponential and the log functions. Next, I will show you two more examples just for fun because there can be variations. The first one will be this. Okay. Number one, there is a log. Number two, I want to apply an exponential to get rid of it. Number three, then I need to combine them first. Wait a second. If I want to combine, do you remember the formula? In order to combine, they have to be the same base. It's either both log 4 or both log 8. Now you have different bases. You cannot use the formula directly. Now what can you do? You need to ask yourself, what do I wish? I wish they have the same base. Then can you change the base of 4 and 8? Suddenly you realize 
Well, I do remember something, that if I don't like the base I have, I can change it. Moreover, I can change it to whatever I want. So how about I change you guys to be base two? If you don't know what I'm doing here, go back and check the change of basis formula from the end of the last section. Okay, the formula basically looks like this. No, 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 not A anymore. Moreover, I can pick whichever C I want. So in this case, I pick two. I put eight here, I put four here. No, I put X here and put, put four here for the first one. Okay, so this is what I used. All right, now that become easy. I prefer to write it as this. Now what you can do is, you can take this one half in. Now you can combine them. Together, it's x5 over 6. So finally, x5 over 6 equals 2 to the 1. If you apply 2 on both sides, and this equals just 2. So what is x? Okay. In order to get rid of the 5 over 6, you multiply it with 6 over 5. When I say multiply, you have to do the power in order to have the multiplication. Okay. On the right, you have something like this, and there is no way to simplify more. This means take the 6th power of 2 and then take the fifth root of that. It's not going to be a pretty number, but we can keep it here. All right, so the takeaway. You are right, we want to combine them, but they don't have the same base. Now you know, you can change the base to whatever you want. In this case, you can always combine them. If you don't like the base, if they're not the same, Change it to everything that you know before. After that, we have this. It becomes standard multiple log. Can you combine them into one? Well, you do the power first, you do the multiplication and dividing later. Once you finish that, do the power. Cancel. All right. Last case. We have many more, by the way. I'm just showing several things for fun. How do we do this? Number one, you need to realize these two are very different. This one you have x squared, then you take the log. This one you take the log first, and then you square the whole thing. Okay? So they have the same operation, but in different order. Therefore, they are different things. Well, the only thing you know is just the power law, uh, the logarithmic law. After that, basically, there's nothing more you can do. So maybe what you want to do now is stare at this thing for a few minutes until you realize, you know, this thing has two structures. The part is L and X, and then the other part is whatever happens to L and X as a whole. And then we are familiar with that is you just assign a new variable to this one. So this basically looks like this. And do you know how to solve this? Yes, that's quadratic. Okay, remember, don't just divide by A, because when you divide by A, your A may be zero. Therefore, a more careful way to do things in this way, then you know A equals zero is one possibility. And of course, A equal two is another possibility. Once you finish, you basically have this. After that, it's pretty easy to do. Apply E on both sides. You have solution 1 and you have solution 2. 
To be careful, you should plug everything back into this original function and try to see, do you have anything negative inside the ln? For this case, both of them qualify. Okay, so there is no uniform way to do general problems. We just need to remember several principles, and after that, you just need to be smart and be persistent when you see something which is kind of strange, meanwhile, kind of familiar. Stick to it, use whatever you can, try to identify the correct formula for the correct situation, and then you will be fine. All right, I left you a quiz, or a, let's say a practice sheet, which give you 16 problems, along with the solutions. So you should try it yourself. This is probably the most important section for everything we learned in chapter four, because everything we learned before is preparing for what we have now. All right. Now, that's enough for solving equations. See more in the practice. Finally, for this end of this chapter, we want to introduce how to do the applications. I will give you three examples. The first one comes from the leftover, from the origin. That is, remember, we have the lacrosse population. Which satisfies the continuous growth rate, y equals p e r t. That's you say, we used it before. Okay, then we say, well, if we know r, so in 2008, we have 27,441 people. In 2020, we have 50,000 people. If we know R, we know this, we can predict or backtrack the population at any time. But then we said, sadly, in real life, we usually don't know this growth rate. Instead, we take two data points instead of one. We want to find the rate by ourselves. Okay. So let me write it down the complete question. That is, in 2008, we have this many. In 2020, we have this many. Now I'm asking, in 2030, okay, how much population we have. Now A equals P E R T. What you need to do now is just pick your principle. You can pick your 2008, you can also pick 2020, doesn't really matter. So I will let just P B, 2008, then P equals 27,441, all right. Now what happens at 2030? Then A is going to be 27,441 times E to the R T from 2008 to 30. That's going to be 22 years. So in order to answer this question, we just need to know R because everything else is there. And how do we get that? We get it from here. Okay. So calculate R. Not only we know 2008, we know 2020. So we know if we plug in the formula for 2020, we should get 50,000, which is only 12 years away from 2008. Now we want to solve for R. And you can see this one become an exponential problem. And what do you do? You apply log. Okay, so let's clean things up a little bit. 12R, how do you get rid of the E? You do LN. This is a chunk of number, but it's a number. So what is your R? Your R is going to be this. It's not pretty, but it's a number. With a calculator, you can do it. Then finally, let's look at 2030. Before we have this, we have 22. We just don't know R. Now we do know R. It looks bad, but it's a number. And in our exam, you can stop here. We don't need anything more. Okay, 
Of course, if you really care about the decimal, take out a calculator and let's do it. E to Z, 22 over 12 okay. times LN, 50,000 divided by 27 for one. The answer is roughly. Okay, so you have 82,000 people roughly in another 10 years. And uh, again, in exam, you stop here because we don't need a, a calculator in exam. But in real life, if you need, the, need it, even though this chunk of number looks really bad, a calculator can handle it. All right. So from here, you can see having a log will help us to solve the problem before. Let's try a different one. This time, well, let's call, let's try radioactive decay. So let's say we have something called carbon-14. It's an element, and it has a half-life of 5,000 years. It's not exactly accurate. It's just a rough number. Okay. Now, if I take an artifact, I get it from, uh, I don't know, the tomb of... Uh, a pharaoh from Egypt in a pyramid, whatever. I find that this one only have 12% of the original mass left. So maybe before it was a cube. Okay, after many, many years, this one decayed to whatever left, okay, from the cube, something like that. Somehow through some technology, I was able to figure out this was only 12% 12, 12 of what we had before. Okay, And we know it takes them 5,000 years to decay 50%. Okay, So we know this one is definitely older than 5,000 years. Okay. Now the question is, how old is the artifact? This is actually a technology people use to assess how old the artifact is, or even how old the bone, a fissile, of a dinosaur is. Okay, you just measure how much um, radioactive element are left, and also you know the half-life of those kind of radioactive elements through experiments. So, let's see. And clearly. You start from 100%. After so many years, you have 12% left. You want to solve for T. And from here, you can see it's not doable. Why? Because you have two variables. You have R and T. So in order to solve for T, you probably have to solve for R first. Okay. So and how do you get from there? Well. You do know if you start from 100%, you do it for 5,000 years, you will have 50% left. That is what we call half-life. Then that's the old trick. You take a log. So what is your R? Again, it looks fancy, but just keep it there. It's just a number. Now, once you know R, let's figure out for 12% how long it is. Okay, then 12%, which is point 0.12. Now get rid of the E. What is LN point 12? We don't care. Divided by this.
That will be the answer. Again, with calculator, you can do one step further. And the answer is... This many years old. That's pretty nice, right? You just take some artifact where you get from archaeology and then you just measure the mass of some elements which you have already known the half life. Then you will be able to backtrack and see how long, how old this artifact is. Okay? That's called the radioactive decay. If you do radiation therapy, it's the same thing. You are going to use this thing to kill tumors. Okay? At a certain percentage. You can use the same thing to determine how long you want the patient to be exposed to um, radioactive rays for the therapy. All right, that's it. That's everything for log and exponential. This section is the most important of the set, uh, chapter because everything we had before is built up towards today. And also everything we did for solving the equation eventually is for the applications in real life on population, radioactive decays, uh, cell populations, bacterial populations, and also compound interest. Okay. All right. That will be all for today.